Good evening and welcome to Social Perspectives. I'm Jay Gentile Everett, and we are delighted that you have joined us on this night. We want to discuss tonight something that's very interesting and something that is going on right now in our country. We are in an impeachment inquiry. The Democrats are saying yes, Republicans are saying no, and yet the church remains silent. The war has begun. What will our next steps be? Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Sometimes God interrupts the normal course of history and gives us leaders whose gifts and insights are used to transform a generation. We have the privilege of presenting such a leader. He is an accomplished jazz musician, best-selling author, entrepreneur, and beloved CM minister of Mill Branch Baptist Church, J.G. Everett Ministries. Our host, Dr. J. Gentile Everett. Impeachment, what a word. Yet it describes the process our political leaders use to check the president when they feel his actions or his decisions warrant this move. We have been a democracy for nearly two and a half centuries, and our country has only impeached two presidents. By the way, our country has never removed a sitting president, even though we have impeached two. The first one was Andrew Johnson in 1868. But when the trial went over to the Senate, he survived and he was acquitted by one single vote. The second one impeached and had that Senate trial was Bill Clinton in 1994. He survived easily the trial and was acquitted and was interesting about that. His popularity soared after he had been acquitted. His popularity went up to 73%. That's amazing. But we've had two other presidents that have had to endure the inquiry of impeachment. Those two, the first was Richard Nixon in 1974, when he ultimately resigned so that he could get around the disgrace and the indignity of being driven out of office when the Supreme Court ordered that his private tapes would have to be made public, he knew then, and given advice from his other political colleagues who were in the Republican Party, they let him know that the votes were not there. It would be only 85 votes in his favor. Thus, he knew he would be removed from office. And the fourth. The current president, Donald J. Trump. Whether you are a Democrat or whether you are a Republican, it is a time that our country will have to endure another impeachment inquiry. What does all of this mean? People do everything that they can, particularly the, the, the religious leaders, and the political leaders, they want to do everything they can to keep from having an impeachment trial because it divides the country. It sets up regiments in various parts of our country, black and white, Democrats, Republican. It's never good for the country to go through an impeachment inquiry, let alone a trial. But this is where we are. The question is, what happened to the voice 
of conscience. Where is that voice? Where is the voice of principle? Where is the voice of the church, which seems to be conspicuously missing? That's the question that we really need to look at. And we will be answering that question, I do believe, before we're finished with this part of our presentation. I want to also say, from the time of George Washington up to the time of Donald J. Trump, many presidents have had to endure investigations. Do you know that even George Washington, there was a group that was trying to impeach him. So it's not that that's such a new thing. You can always have innuendo, unfounded rumors, all sorts of propagandistic ideas being spread to disrupt or to dethrone, to take away the presidency from its current occupant. That's relatively routine. Let's face it, no leader will ever please everybody. So that we are accustomed to. But I go back to my lifetime. I don't know much about what happened uh, during the Nixon era, but I've read. Richard Nixon became president in 1968 and was elected again in 1972. From 1968 to now, so we're talking about the last 50 years, do you know every president, every elected president in the last 50 years have had to endure either an independent council investigation or a special counsel investigation. Every elected president, I would have you know, but there was one president who never had to deal with independent counsel investigations, nor special counsel investigations, and that president was Barack Obama. Isn't that interesting? Whatever you want to say about his policies, whatever political ideas you may have that differ from what he espoused, one thing that is clear, he obviously had principle that was glaring, and he obviously believed in no drama. What I want to say to all of us tonight about that. At least we had a president that demonstrated you can lead, and you can lead with dignity, and you can lead without pejoratively speaking about your enemies or your political adversaries. At least he brought to us a decency that is conspicuously missing right now. In other words, at least he had a presidency. Whether you accept the policies or not, he had a presidency that was immersed in decency and decorum. And the drama of the salacious and demagoguery was absent. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. I've been feeling like this my last chance on What's up, world? It's Rough Guy Rhymes, the leader of the Dream Big Lifestyle. And I'm here to tell you to dream big. Welcome back to our second segment of Social Perspectives. We were talking about decency in the White House. We were talking about presidents who've had to face all kinds of opposition and adversarial uh, people and figures and characters. 
But now we're going to talk about the results. The reason why impeachment is simply not always good for the country. We do recognize it is good for order and it is good for accountability, those things we must have. But I am talking about the schisms and the division that impeachment will certainly cause in our community. Among our ordinary people, the ordinary, because everybody is going to take a side, everybody is going to have information, and they're going to have support in their own mind for why they take that particular side. The sad thing about it is what I am seeing, the division that this impeachment has begun to cause within our country is uh, many of us didn't live in the Jim Crow era. We didn't. But, but we are starting to, to see and hear some of the rhetoric that was associated with that period. And that rhetoric is ugly. I am just hoping that when we get through this, we can go back to being civil in our political and social discourses. I have to tell you about this rhetoric and about these ideas um, that I am seeing that, that are surfacing uh, during this impeachment period. The other day, I was uh, entering a, a very opulent building. It was massive and colossal, and I, I went into this building and I needed to get to the elevator to go to the floor uh, where, I, where my visit was to take place. And uh, when, I, when I got in the elevator, there was a, a senior white lady, the only one in the elevator. I got on and I, uh, when I got in the elevator, I spoke and the lady did not return um, that favor. I said, okay, no problem. I stayed as close to the door as I could. And she was as far back against the wall as she could, holding and clutching her, her pocketbook. I don't know what she thought that I was going to do. I was just trying to go in and do what I was supposed to do and leave. It appeared that she was pressing herself against the wall at the back, and she kept on pushing herself seemingly back against the wall. And I, I, I thought, wow, if she could, she probably wish she could just go through that back wall and not have to deal with me at all. But when I got to the floor, the door opened and I turned and I said to her, I hope you have a great day. She still did not say anything and I felt that's okay. I walked on away and went to my meeting. When my meeting was over, that incident sort of stayed on my mind because I was saying to myself, I wonder what did she think I was going to do? I mean, she did not know I was a pastor. She did not know that I'm a law-abiding person. I get that. But it seemed as though she immediately chose the worst of those possibilities. It's sort of like, I got to make sure I'm going to protect myself because I'm on this elevator with this gentleman. Although I'm not sure she considered me a gentleman at that time. But I came on out and I was getting in my car and as I was getting in my car, this same lady was getting in, was in her car and the car was, uh, was started, it was, the engine was running and there was someone behind her waiting to get the part that she was getting ready to vacate, but she never seemed to move. She kept putting the car in drive and she would go up on the curb and, and the car would come back. And it was as though she kept getting frustrated because she wanted to get away from that place to go to her, her next destination. But for some reason, she could not quite get the car in gear. And the people behind her, of course, started to swear, and they wanted the lady to get out of the way. She was holding up the line. 
I looked and I saw the lady becoming visibly upset. The discomfort was about her face and her brow. She was not happy, but it seemed like she just didn't know what to do and nobody would do anything. So I took it upon myself and I went to the car and I knocked on the window and, and she looked at me with astonishment. I guess she was wondering, why are you here? And I said to her, ma'am, are you all right? There are people trying to get into this park and you seem to be having difficulty in moving your car. Is there anything I can do? And for some reason, when I said that, she became very inviting and she became appreciative. I said to her, whatever the problem is, I tell you what I can do, I can move your car and, and get it out of the way so that these others can get in their park and would that be, will you be okay if I could do that? And she said, yes. Well, I backed her car out and got it out of the way and opened the door and made sure that she got in the car. She was extremely happy and very thrilled. She was thankful and she just kept on begging me. And she then admitted she just had a moment where she became disoriented. She said, I just, I didn't know what to do. She called it a senior moment. I said, I understand. That's okay. That's what people are here for, to make life better for others. So after that, she wanted to know who I was, and we talked briefly, and I told her who I was, and told her what I did. She was so happy that she got the help. Thing that came to my mind was I thought about words of Jesus. Love your enemies. Do good to those who despitefully use or misuse you. Be kind to one another, for it is the way of God. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. It's a lifestyle. It's a culture, more than just a brand. The Doshe. Welcome back to Social Perspectives. We were talking about our presidential impeachment inquiry, the period that we're in right now. The question is, what is the church message? while we're in this period. What should the church be teaching or what is the church teaching while we are in this period? First thing I want everybody to understand, the gospel is meaningless until we can apply it to the existential moments of our lives. You see, we have to take the gospel and we have to make the gospel real and relevant to the people who live now, one of the greatest tragedies that I've seen over and over in many of our churches, we keep trying to teach a theology that is uh, locked in a time period that's long past. So what should our message be in this current environment? One of the things that I hope we will do is to recognize that all people make mistakes one of the things about leadership, leaders should be the one that showed the example that leadership is not flawless. Leaders are flawed. And when leaders make mistakes, it would be well for his followers to hear him or her admit that they make mistakes and that they are sorry. It's kind of hard to be an effective leader if you are not going to have the presence of mind to recognize when you make a mistake. And this is presidents and preachers and priests, 
politicians, we all make mistakes. You know, we probably could have gotten around some of this if we could have had the president, perhaps, to just say, I made a mistake. He's new at the job. We could have certainly used that as an example of why he was inept when it came to certain decisions that he's been asked to make. It's okay. Why can't we just say, I'm sorry? Why can't politicians just say, I'm sorry? It does not denote a weakness. It does not project that you are in some way too weak to lead. On the contrary, it suggests that you have strength of character that is of such that you are able to recognize when you don't hit the mark, when you make a mistake, and you are big enough to admit it. Sometimes a simple apology makes it all go away. One thing I found out, when someone does something wrong and they just admit it and they ask for forgiveness, the onus is no longer on them. It is on the one who received the apology. I would hope that part of the church message, this is not about the admitting guilt or innocence of anything, but can't we at least share with our congregants the importance of just being able to say, I'm sorry. It will not kill you. It will do nothing but enhance your own character. It will say that you are so big that you refuse to allow your ego to get in the way and strip you of the opportunity to be contrite. Church, let's share with our community, whatever side that we are on, politicals, whatever the political side, whatever, if we're Democrats, if we are Republicans, it's okay. Somebody needs to say, I'm sorry. Whoever the progenitor of all of this, I would hope, would come to the realization that sometimes you can get out of a whole lot of issues by simply making an apology. When people refuse to make an apology, when some feel that their narcissistic malignancy keeps them from saying, I'm sorry, you make matters worse, and you make matters worse for those who are on your side, those who stand ready to defend you. Let's not forget the power of forgiveness. Let's not forget what God wants us to do. Sometimes he just simply wants us to repent and say, I'm sorry for my actions. I would hope and pray that this message could get to Washington and that every politician could just calm down a minute and get in a room and quit worrying about their political stripe Put on hold your own ego and the things that you really want to see that will enhance your power in various districts. Let's just get together and say, let's do what's best for America. And it starts with both sides. Perhaps say, I'm sorry for what I may have caused. Hopefully this will permeate Hopefully it will pierce the conscience and will cause Washington and our communities to change because I do not want to see us back in a social civil war. It won't be a physical one, but I am hoping it won't be a racial one either, and it will not be a social one, but that we can go back and embrace civility and be the city shining on the hill, like President Reagan said many years ago. I'm gonna to have to leave it there.
we have to do another part of this. I know it is so much I want to share with you about the impeachment and the message of the church. We're going to have to do it in our next show. But I want you to know we appreciate you being here with us tonight. It was joy sharing with you. We look forward to doing it next week, same time. J. Gentil Everett, we'll see you next week. Hello again, and I want to say to all of you, Gentil has a preferred business list. You'll see that on the screen as the credits roll by. I want you to know that I'm excited to announce that we have some really good businesses in our area that I would hope and pray that each of you will support. One of them is First Capital Bank in Laurenburg. I've dealt with them for years. They've always been there for me. Just a great group of people there. Please go there and tell them that I sent you by. They'll take care of you. They really, really will. Home Game Sports restaurant in Fairmont. Oh, what a wonderful place to be. They got a wonderful ambiance in there that brings a, a, a sports feel to it. You will love it. Food always tastes great. Then while there, if fish is what you prefer, hey, there's no other place to go than to go to the fish house in Fairmont. Gail and Andre Taylor are the proprietors of that restaurant and oh my my, it's always quite good. Then go see Lumberton Honda when you need a car and you're in Robinson County. Go we'll talk with Tyrone Davis and Kent Locklear. They'll hook you up. You will like that experience with them, I promise you. Don't forget McKellar Check Cashing in Dillon, South Carolina. They have been just friends of our church, friends to me personally and my family. What a wonderful, wonderful company. And they are committed to serving your needs. And if you're in Lorenberg, there's only one place to buy a car. And that's at Scotland Motors. Go over there and see Lee Howell and tell him Gentile sent you by. He has a tremendous selection and he'll treat you right. Lastly, I have to tell you, when you're in Lorenberg and you want some show not good food, you need to go to the Clinton Inn. That buffet there is always out of sight. Dream big. Hey, I like that. Make sure you go online and you check out that website because it's going to bring joy to your life. You deal with music, retail, you name it. Adrian Ruffin, he's got it going. You better make sure you go there. Also, last but not least, you owe it to yourself. If you want a pro to do your videography, there's only one place you need to go. That is RSM Productions. That's the only place to go. Check it out online. Our good friend, Kendrick Bostick, he is a master at his craft. Check him out. See you soon. Thank mm -hmm. you.